Dr. Rose, uh, we are focusing on the process uh, uh, of recording ICRT's ongoing history on the society as it parallels the history of heart and lung transplantation and MCS. Uh, to that end, we are interviewing pioneers in this field like yourself. Appreciate it. So, as we all know, you had an amazingly dynamic and illustrious career in medicine. And uh, when and how did you become interested in medicine? Uh, I got to medicine circuitously. Uh, in college, I actually wanted to be a journalist. Uh, I was uh, at Columbia College actually in the late 1960s, which was a very tumultuous time. The campus in 1968 actually was overtaken by students. Uh, that was the year just before I entered. It was the middle of all of Vietnam era, mm. uh, student uprisings, uh, and the like. Um, and I joined the staff of the newspaper at uh, Columbia, the Columbia Spectator. And that was a great, great time. Uh, the editor-in-chief at that time was a, a, a very famous now sociologist, uh, medical sociologist named Paul Starr, who's at Princeton. Uh, and I had a writing tutorial essentially every night mm. with Paul, with whatever junky thing I had written, he would turn it into something that I'd get a byline for. Uh, so that was really addictive. Um, but then by 1971, the campus turned quiet, and I was starting to be assigned to stories you know, about food in the cafeteria uh, and stuff like that. Um, so my interest wandered a bit. I took a course, I majored in psychology actually in college, but one of the psychology courses that I took was in physiological psychology, and the professor was one of the world experts then in his youth in the field of color vision, which was essentially mm -hmm. physiology, and I loved it. I just loved it. So um, that reoriented me towards the sciences. I took organic chemistry, and, uh, and then I went from Columbia College into the Columbia Medical School. And from there, how did you get into cardiothoracic surgery? Uh, circuitously uh, also. <laughs> uh, my original interest in medical school was to do infectious disease. Uh, and I, in that regard, I was inspired by a, a faculty member named Harold New, who was a brilliant infectious disease uh, clinician and researcher. And then I came to the conclusion that Harold knew everything. So there was really not much. This is, this is just when all the bacterial illnesses, you know, we had the delusion that uh, infectious disease was conquered um, before HIV. Uh, and, and I just had the sense that nobody could know any more than, than Harold knew, no pun intended. Uh, so I started thinking about other things. Uh, I was inspired by a surgeon named Al Mark Markowitz, who was a general surgeon at, at Columbia, who was a very erudite, thoughtful, um, rational, Socratic teacher. And uh, I thought he was great. So in my third year, I, I switched from an interest in internal medicine uh, to an interest in surgery. Mm -hmm. And then in surgery, initially I wanted to do pediatric surgery, not cardiac surgery. Uh, I spent some time in a uh, surgical metabolism lab where the, the question of the day was whether or not you should use D5W or amino acids uh, as standard uh, maintenance fluids. Turned out it didn't make a difference. I thought that was a pretty boring question and uh, asked my program director if I could go work in another lab. In fact, I was ready to go work in the emergency room rather than keep mm. doing that. And he assigned me to a uh, cardiac surgical lab with Henry Spotnitz and David Bregman, one of the original mm. balloon pumpers. And uh, as a PGY2 resident, I started putting animals on heart lung machines and using left ventricular assist devices mm. and counter pulsation devices uh, in the early 70s, and that, that hooked me. Do you recall when the first heart transplant was performed? Do you recall where you were at the time? Do you recall the, uh, 
the you know the the difference between Chris Barnard doing the first and Shumway waiting to do the first in this time of period. Well, I, I was in college uh, with the original, so I was more interested in girls rock and roll and uh, <laughs> what I was going to do with my life. Uh, and the Barnard thing was a bit of a circus uh, in the late '60s, and being in New York, you know, big media town, uh, certainly there was. Uh, a good deal of interest in it. If I remember in medical school, the, the chief of cardiac surgery who I succeeded at Columbia, Jim Mom, at my anatomy table uh, as a medical student came and said, uh, I asked him about heart transplantation. He said, we do real operations in this hospital. We don't do any of this newfangled uh, heart transplantation. It doesn't work, and we're not interested in it. And that was kind of the uh, end of my interest for, for quite some time. But it made an impression on you as, as a sort of young person approaching medicine or? Heart transplantation, no. At that time, definitely quite, quite the opposite. And then during my residency, uh, Keith Reemsma, um, who was clearly one of the visionaries of this field, uh, he was doing heart transplantation at, at Columbia. And I, I had a you know, distant point of observation as a resident during it. Hmm. Uh, but the results were not good. The only survivor in the initial 13 patients that were done at Columbia from, I think it was 77 through 80, only one survived long term. And I got to know him because I took care of him, as did every other resident, because he spent more than a year in the mm. hospital after his, uh, his heart transplant. Um, but he, he ultimately lived 18 years. Um, and Keith... Um, instituted a moratorium on the program in 1980. This, this, that was a time when most people were beginning to give up. Mm. Um, but he was always some, someone with a long-term plan. And uh, he, he meant this as a temporary hold. Uh, at that time, I had just entered my uh, cardiac surgery residency, so we were no longer doing heart transplants. Mm. I wanted to stay as a faculty member. And Keith told me that I could stay um, with, with the understanding that I would restart the heart transplant program. I had no interest in doing that. <laughs> Jim Mom, that same fellow who told me in the anatomy lab that it's not a real operation, mm -hmm. we don't do it here, told me, at that time I wanted to be a pediatric cardiac surgeon. He said, um, just put up with this. Keith will get over this transplant stuff and you can do real heart surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so take the job and don't worry about the transplantation stuff. And Keith was uh, you know, smart enough to send me out to Stanford where uh, Bruce Wrights was just starting to do his heart-lung transplants. Bill Baumgartner mm. was out there, obviously Dr. Shumway as well, and they were great, great teachers. Uh, they were very generous uh, with their time to allow me to see how they set stuff up. Uh, I was able to observe Ed Stinson's Friday morning heart transplant conference, and I can tell you that Columbia has had a Friday morning heart transplant conference since 1982 and still does. Uh, and I read biopsies uh, on a daily with Margaret Billingham. Talking of these guys, who would you credit as the most influential individual or mentors in, in shaping your career? Oh, Keith, for sure. Keith Reams, Keith without Reams, no. question. Mm. Uh, I, I learned the, 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 the technical um, and the medical piece of heart surgery from Jim Mom, a uh, fellow named Fred Bowman, uh, from Henry Spotnitz, from David Bregman. But I learned long-term vision from Keith, and I think in particular, um, second-generation heart transplanters like me, uh, if we didn't have these absolutely, uh, at some level, crazy, uh, but at the, at the more important level, incredibly creative people uh, who, who really did have a feel for what it, it could become, um, the field wouldn't exist. Mm.
So I feel very lucky in that regard. After this initial sort of experience, uh, you, yeah. you pioneered pediatric heart transplantation. And in, I think in 1984, yeah. you made history performing the first successful pediatric heart transplant. Yes, and in 1984, uh, I was 33 years old. At the time, we had done maybe 20 adult heart transplants. And the primary driver for our doing that um, was the patient's mother. Um, this was a child who had had a single ventricle uh, heart. His ventricle was failing. The mother had, and this is kind of pre-internet, hmm. but she had researched heart transplantation. Had, uh, the child had been taken care of at Columbia, though they, they came from Denver hmm. at that point. And um, there certainly was informed consent in terms of going ahead with this, uh, in terms of our um, being very candid with her as to her, our, our ignorance as to how to do this uh, in children. So were you dragged into this by the family, literally, or did you? I dragged would be an exaggeration, but I, I think we, we uh, unless they really wanted to do it, hmm. um, and unless we had really laid out all the potential obstacles mm -hmm. uh, to them, we, we, we weren't going to do it. And, and the family was great. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, his name was J.P. Levette. Mm -hmm. um, I retransplanted him about five years later. Uh, he lived for another uh, 22 years. Fantastic. Uh, actually took a master's, became a, a bioethicist at the Sorbonne. He had a lot of girlfriends. Uh, he got into medical school and unfortunately uh, died suddenly in his first week of medical school oh. at uh, Buffalo Sudi. And after this first success, yeah. you were sort of uh, stimulated to take pediatric heart transplantation oh, yeah. forward. To, yes, we, as, we had a your, very good- As your baby. Yes, we had, a, we had a terrific pediatric cardiology group at Columbia. Um, I had a wonderful colleague, that's, that Linda Adnesio, who is one of the pioneer pediatric cardiologists in the space. Um, and we, we turned a, a single case into a program. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I've, I've learned as a heart transplanter that building programs with teams of people um, allows ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And, we had had that test experience doing it in, in adults, and uh, I was lucky enough to be able to tap into mm. the pediatric mm. sphere. And how, how, do you, how do you see the, the role of pediatric transplantation today and possibly for the future? Do you think it's still the same or has it slightly changed? The, 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 the um, I think it's mature, much more mature field than it was. Um, I think compared to the relative role of mechanical support versus adult heart transplantation, that, that the mechanical uh, approach in children is still a long way uh, in the distance. Um, you know, and, and, and heart failure management itself has obviously improved so much and the caliber of, uh, of, of curative or palliative cardiac surgery has improved so much since that period of time that the, the patient populations have, have changed. Mm. Um, but still, and to get 20 plus years of survival, um, it, it's hard to beat that in sure. terms of therapeutic potency for someone who's otherwise got a fatal disease. Being involved in pediatric transplantation obviously has led you to the interest in xenotransplantation. Yes. You've been a strong supporter since you know, your early days and you've, you've contributed a lot. Yeah. Can, you, can you give us an idea how you got involved initially? Initially I got involved because of Keith. Um, Keith uh, had been a pioneer of xenotransplantation in the 60s. He had done a uh, chimpanzee uh, um, kidney implant before dialysis and obviously dialysis took its place. Uh, so he had a scientific interest in it, and it was, uh, especially being in New York, uh, there was no shortage of recipients for us. We were absolutely swamped with recipients, and we grew to be a very, very big heart transplant program. Uh, 
uh, just because of the density of the population that surrounded us. When, when you saw all these people that are on a waiting list, and, and we had deaths all the time on our waiting list, you know, a durable alternative to transplantation um, became, I'd say, the theme of my research and just really for the last 25 years. Uh, and that started with Zeno because of Keith's interest. Mm -hmm. And we took that a long way. Um, we, we did uh, Cinemalgus monkey to baboon transplantation uh, using the then state-of-the-art immunosuppressive cocktails, uh, reached the conclusion that we actually could make a chimp heart implant work uh, in humans by the late 80s, um, and put together a protocol uh, to do just that. Um, I actually got that protocol through an institutional review board, and the year that we got that protocol approved was the first year of what are called institutional animal care and use committees. So the human subjects protection group um, approved it, and the animal protection uh, group disapproved it. Because um, at that time, most chimps were being used for HIV research. They're an endangered species, and the sense was that we really couldn't epidemiologically make a big dent. Uh, for me, that was an intellectual crossroads, whether or not mm. to spend all my time you know, going to committee meetings justifying doing clinical xenotransplantation. And uh, it was really that point that uh, uh, my interest refocused towards implantable uh, assist devices. Mm -hmm. What's your point of view today on xenotransplantation, and maybe f not only on today, but also for the future? Do you think well, there's still will play a role? You know, I, I continue to love the Norman Shumway comment that it's the future of transplantation and always will be. Um, I, I'm not that skeptical anymore, but I think using primates as a donor source is just not going to be uh, feasible. Uh, even though I think it's immunologically uh, probably quite feasible, um, I, I think discordant xeno uh, is the only um, societally tolerable approach to it. Mm. Uh, and that's still a very tough nut to crack uh, immunologically. Mm. I, I, I think it will be, but um, but I don't. So you See don't give us much hope for the future, for Zeno? It depends the clinical on your success. definition of the future. If, there, <laughs> if, if the future is uh, <laughs> my own personal career, not a chance. But yes. uh, uh, in my lifetime, maybe. I'd love to see it. When you were directing uh, the Columbia um, program, it was one of the largest transplant centers in the world. Sure. Um, can you tell us um, how you were able to accomplish this, this uh, task and what were, what were the greatest obstacles when you started it to get there? Um, in one sense, the greatest obstacle was actually one of the greatest enablers. Uh, we had a fairly dysfunctional hospital um, with leadership that really, I, I don't think, really knew what was going on. So I started to do a heart transplantation the same year that MGH the Massachusetts General Hospital announced that they were not going to do heart transplantation. Uh, I think they had a very hands-on, well-run hospital. Um, we were able to fly under the radar screen, uh, and with Keith, we, we just did it. Uh, one of Keith's famous lines was, uh, uh, to not ask permission, seek forgiveness. And that was kind of the mantra that allowed us to get started. So we had, uh, we had no organized hospital infrastructure to do it, um, but we created ourselves. Um, and and the, the most important thing I learned at Stanford is uh, uh, it takes a village to do heart transplantation. Uh, I neglected to mention an, an, another person with whom I spent a lot of time uh, at Stanford was Sharon Hunt. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that she was the um, go-to person once you got per past the early perioperative period, Sharon, uh, people like Sharon, Margaret Billingham, infectious disease people, 
that's who is the key to the patient's well-being. Um, Keith had uh, recruited a cardiologist named Ron Drusen um, to be the medical director of heart transplantation. Uh, he actually joined me out at Stanford for a period of time. We had a very, we had a terrific nurse coordinator. I, see, I didn't even know what a nurse coordinator was. Uh, there were so many good people at Stanford doing that as well. And um, we, we, we did it by unabashed total imitation. Mm. Uh, of their infrastructure, which... But, but you were obviously also one of the very, very few people who, who were into this sort of multidisciplinary approach, yes. which we now, you know, everybody talks yes. about it, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's the most modern approach. So you yes. were obviously one of those guys who, who, who it, implemented... It was not it. the obvious way to do it. Yes. And, and in terms of obstacles, uh, the chair of medicine at Columbia at that time wanted nothing to do with heart transplantation. Um, so uh, we actually hired the cardiologists into the Department of Surgery, people who were in private practice. Mm -hmm. We hired, and because there was no way to, to make the economics of heart transplantation on a fee-for-service basis with the cardiologists, we essentially taxed the surgical fees 40, 50 percent and used those fee, that fee money to hire all the nurse coordinators, all the cardiologists, uh, infectious disease people, we created essentially our own interdisciplinary uh, clinical and economic entity. Mm. Uh, and a few years later, when that chair of medicine had left, um, Mike Weisfeld, a great cardiologist, came to be chair of medicine uh, at Columbia. I served as chair of surgery for a period of time with him. When he got to Columbia, he asked me, why are all the cardiologists in, in transplantation working for the Department of Surgery? And I told him because his predecessor didn't want to have uh, any part of it. Uh, he didn't like the idea that our patients would take the beds of potential pneumonia patients. Mm. Um, and he said, you know, would you mind if, you know, we as a department got back into it and uh, uh, we hired a much larger group of very accomplished heart failure people. Milton Packer joined uh, us. I helped recruit him. Um, we, we, we expanded. Ron stayed with it, but we had um, you know, a large cadre of research-oriented and clinically-oriented heart failure people. So this, all, this whole thing obviously help, also helped Columbia Absolutely. to sort of uh, improve their profile and their oh, image on the, on the public perception. Yeah, I'd say Columbia had, had had strong heart surgery, but um, really didn't have strong coronary bypass surgery. So in the 80s, uh, centers that were doing that uh, had much more visibility. Mm. Uh, when we started to do heart transplantation, though, we, were, we clearly uh, put Columbia back on the map in cardiology. Coming back to Elbads, sure. um, you were the lead investigator in the very famous rematch sure. trial, a landmark study demonstrating the efficacy of Elbad therapy in comparison to optimal medical treatment in heart failure. Right. Can you tell us what it was like to run such an important multi-center trial? Uh, th that trial, in many respects was uh, almost a career. The trial itself took, um, I'd say, three years to enroll and um, maybe four or five years to, to get to the um, final observations. But the trial really took um, more than 10 years to do. Um, We had our first meeting of the rematch investigators in 1994 in Venice when I was uh, president of the ISHLT. And one of the big contributions, I think, of, of working together with cardiologists in heart failure is they uh, had much more experience and respect for randomized prospective trials in terms of changing behavior. And, and People like Lynn Warner Stevenson um, had a tremendous impact, I think, in driving um, the vision that we needed to, to test these devices with that level of evidence-based medicine. The devices weren't ready in 94. We weren't ready to do uh, uh, the trials uh, either, clearly, in terms of our infrastructure. 
my understanding of randomized trials in the early 90s was, you know, pick a number and flip a coin. Um, I had no idea what power calculations were, uh, sample size uh, and the like. And um, it was a real learning process with a fabulous team uh, of people uh, at, at a center that Keith had founded called the International Center for Health Outcomes and Innovation Research called Inquire, with whom I still work uh, now at, at Mount Sinai. And, and in particular, the Inquire uh, leaders, particularly Anatine Gelines, um, they wanted to do this, and they were willing to put in the hard work, the statistical um, piece of this, uh, the grant writing infrastructure, uh, assembly, the data acquisition, all, all of the pieces of the puzzle, um, they attended to all of this. How, how was it to deal with the FDA at the time? That is a story unto itself, actually. Um, I think the conventional wisdom of the United States, when we started to think about this, was that this could never be done, particularly in the United States, that the only place to do um, cutting-edge research, clinical research using VADs was in Europe because the regulatory climate was too stifling. Um, the, uh, David Kessler became um, FDA commissioner around that time. Um, he had actually uh, been appointed by George Bush and kept over by Bill Clinton. And I knew David. Uh, he, had, he had been at uh, Einstein Montefiore in the Bronx. There was a time where I had been uh, potentially recruited there. I got to know him. Um, and one of my nurse uh, coordinators, a woman named uh, Kathy Catanese, we recruited from Einstein. She also knew him. And uh, we, we went to see him. And we had a very candid discussion around the state of the art. That we, we were interested in, in pursuing rigorous clinical evaluation of left ventricular assist devices. But we had the sense that the FDA device um, personnel were just not interested in it. And I think that was, having dealt with them at that point, we were right. Uh, he agreed. Um, he said, uh, I've got a lot of work to do at the agency. Um, but I assure you that you, you will find people in this agency that are receptive to doing a trial like this. I was supposed to uh, debate one of the uh, FDA um, evaluators at an American Heart Association meeting in the mid-90s. Um, and as it turns out, I debated an empty podium because he didn't show up. Uh, he had been fired. And the entire group, uh, Kessler, replaced uh, essentially all of the critical uh, people. And the people that, we, that he replaced them with were terrific. They were receptive. That's not to mean they were easy. They were not easy. But they made us much better investigators. Um, so it changed. Um, and, and without his leadership at the FDA, uh, I don't think that we could have had that change. Do you think, looking back, do you think this, this process has changed today? Is it, in other words, is it easier today if you have, let's say, investigational device to bring it on to pra into practice? Or, well, so basically I, your example, has this led to a, uh, let's say, of an easier way of getting through the system? I think easier is the wrong way, uh, wrong word. To, it's, it's a predictable, a much more predictable way. Uh, easy is not what I would, the term I would use. So it's still to, difficult. It's discipline, but I think there are clear um, rules of the road um, that have served this field very well. If you look at the recent regulatory history of the FDA, uh, I think that they've been a big help mm -hmm. to the development of, uh, of devices. And also having the intellectual rigor of the randomized trial and rematch, and now the more recent randomized trial with HeartMate 2, um, it also set um, the groundwork for reimbursement, which uh, 
the, the clinical value in terms of survival, uh, the, the requirements for reimbursement in the United States are subtly different from the requirements for regulatory approval by the FDA. For the FDA, it's safe and effective. For Medicare, it's reasonable and necessary. We got to reasonable and necessary by showing a survival and a quality of life benefit. Hmm. It was not hard to persuade people that something that made people live longer and feel better was not reasonable and necessary. Uh, you had, you, you as primary investigator, you had to take a lot of criticism after the, after the, the trial, although it was a break, breakthrough trial. Sure. So how did you manage to basically sh to, sh to shake this off? Um, there was public criticism. There was sure, all sorts of criticism. Sure, and there still is. Uh, I think that we ha the fact that there were so many different um, points of view at polar opposites. When we started the trial, there were people who thought that it was immoral to put these devices in anybody and people who thought it was immoral to not put devices in everybody. And, and the sheer, that polarization, if anything, I think motivated us even more uh, because neither uh, poll had strong evidence um, to support the position. And the, and the result of the trial, uh, I think, was much more nuanced and a lot more interesting than just an issue of whether or not hmm. devices should be used, uh, because the results were mediocre. So the control group had terrible results. The VAD group had mediocre results. But the trial also provided insight into what, what the rate limiters were uh, in terms of reliability, infection, bleeding. And, and you can see that the, the field has now evolved to uh, address certainly the reliability issue I think we're a lot better at, the infection issue we're a lot better at. But I think the next generation of devices is going to need to be fully implantable. But it's not so long ago. It's not so long ago. We've, got, we've, we've come a long way. 25 years for penicillin to become Absolutely. clinically we've available. Absolutely. We've come a long way. But so, so how do you see the, the next, let's say, 10 years for implantable devices from your expert view? I don't see any eureka moments. But you can, you can see that the caliber of devices that's being implanted now is light years. It's like comparing uh, you know, a high-speed internet connection to uh, a phone modem. To look at the newer devices now, the, the centrifugal uh, devices, uh, the, uh, uh, the HeartMate 2 device itself is a fairly sophisticated device. Uh, you know, there's a Gordon conference now every two years uh, in the VAD space that uh, John Watson, who at the NIH, uh, who I also, he, he was just a terrific mentor uh, for me, particularly through the rematch trial uh, as well. Um, if you go to those conferences every two years, it's really interesting to see how the, the subject matter and the tenor of the conference changes. The field is clearly reaching a point of inflection. How has the public, ch the public changed in terms of perception? I think that, that lags still. Uh, the achievement of uh, two-year survival is now greater than 60 percent, uh, I think is a stunning achievement. I don't know that that's permeated um, uh, the heart failure cardiology community yet, although I think it's, it's starting to get there. And there's no reason that that 60% can't become 80%. Uh, and then, of course, as, as we get to that, you, you'll want to see the four, or five, six, seven year survivals that were not even on our radar screen yeah. when you know, we early heart transplanters would come to this meeting. Um, you know, five year survivals were, were, were uh, virtual. Mm. Uh, you mentioned pediatric bars uh, earlier. Yeah. Uh, do you see there uh, some some future for this as well, or do you think this is, we're still a bit stuck with with this uh, issue? No, I think there. I think there the um, the ability to to downsize the existing devices 
is stunning. Um, I remember, I don't know if it was two or three Gordon conferences ago, um, engineers brought these tiny little things that were, uh, you know, uh, the size of uh, half a cigarette or a triple A battery, you know, that could pump five liters a minute. Hmm. And, uh, you know, within two years, uh, uh, there's the impeller pump. Hmm. It was these guys' design. Um, so th the miniaturization, uh, I think, is quite impressive. Hmm. Uh, I mean, durability, though, for children, obviously, what, what's acceptable uh, is and should be a lot different from what's acceptable in adults. And the clinical populations are so much smaller that it's hard to get the experience, but, but it will get there. Moving, coming back to heart transplantation. Sure, sure. Uh, recently, you co-authored a study that identified a significantly diminished post-transplant survival for class two and three obesity. Mm -hmm. How do you think this will affect heart transplantation given the obesity epidemic now plaguing North America? Well, even though the results are worse, it, it doesn't mean that the patients have not benefited from having heart transplantation. Uh, obesity, and actually I spent a fair amount of my early scientific career interested in obesity. Uh, I did obesity research when I was in college with a physiological psychologist, uh, or a social psychologist named Stanley Schachter. And it was an incurable disease then, and it is an incurable disease now, um, I, I don't think that you can deny transplantation to obese patients. That um, I don't think obese, obesity is a character flaw in these patients. And one of the things that was uh, often stated at our Friday morning conferences is, uh, you know, there, there are very few diseases that ought to be punishable by death. Mm. Uh, and if a heart transplant can, can meaningfully improve your life and prolong it, then you ought to be a heart transplant candidate. How do you see the future of heart transplantation in general? Um, I think that uh, heart transplantation is going to look more and more like kidney transplantation. Uh, and that the interface between heart transplantation and mechanical support, uh, we will reach a point of inflection at which many more patients will have mechanical support compared to transplantation. And the gateway into being transplanted, in, as it is already with bridging, um, the, that, that will be the relationship. It'll still be a better therapy if you can get it, but the way to access heart transplantation is gonna be through the mechanical route. You left Columbia recently to become uh, the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Associate Director for Clinical Outcomes at Mount Sinai. What factors influenced you to make that change? Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, I had been a, I, I went from doing heart transplantation uh, to running cardiac surgery at Columbia, and then I was a chair of surgery for 14 years. And that was a wonderful, just a great, great job. Uh, I was able to expand my, my personal intellectual horizons beyond heart surgery to, to fields that I didn't have a good feel for. We built solid organ transplant programs in liver and a great renal transplant program, pancreas program, a lung transplant program, uh, terrific oncology program, things like that. Um, but being a chair now, I think, is a very different job from what a chairmanship meant um, you know, in the not too distant past. Uh, when I started uh, as uh, the chair of surgery at Columbia, the department was kind of a club. There were some people that were full-time in the department. There were people in private practice. Um, there was some cooperation between the two of them, but it, it was by no means a program the way our heart transplant program. Um, and my vision for the department was to make the department uh, programmatic. Um, that is... Uh, there's a lot of uh, people management in that. And I had learned a good deal of that uh, in managing a heart transplant program. Um, 
but running a department of surgery took it to a different scale where I had 100 surgeons or so in the department, 50 residents, a total of 400 employees. Uh, the department was responsible for about $300 million a year worth of work uh, in the hospital. When I started as chair, we had a hospital that was near bankrupt. We merged with another hospital midway through my chairmanship, which was uh, an anxiety-provoking time. Um, and I'd say the, the entropy of doing that kind of work um, and, in, and also running a business that, uh, and, and departments and hospitals are businesses, uh, that I think are poorly designed businesses now that I run a, uh, a real for-profit business uh, as well. Uh, it, it was time for me to move on. Uh, Do you think for transplant surgeons in particular, since it's a very stressful profession, obviously, yeah. do you think there is sort of a time when they should consider changing their practice and move on and uh, hand it over to younger people? Or do you think it is just something which you can do as long as you possibly can do it, and then you just stop by default? I'd say I'm in the former school. Um, and, and certainly, I, I ran heart transplantation uh, at Columbia for 10 years. Uh, but when I became chief of cardiac surgery, I appointed um, Rob Mitchler, who's now a very successful departmental chair as well. Uh, and I got out of his way. Um, when when I, I succeeded Keith, um, his, uh, he stayed around, but he understood the parental role. Mm. And particularly the physical demands of heart transplantation, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you stay in transplantation, I think there are many, many examples of people who stay uh, singly focused on heart transplantation or the Tom Starzl type that, you know, keep doing yes. it into their 80s. That, that works. But if you, you have a busy surgical practice in other spheres, mm -hmm. if you take on leadership responsibilities in a department, I think you owe it to the transplant program to allow young people uh, and people who are going to do it full time um, to run it. As a successful teacher, as you know, it's not easy nowadays to convince young people, students, medical students, no. residents, to go into heart transplantation to do that. Sure. Uh, because of poor social quality of life issues, sure. unfriendly working hours, etc. Right. What would you tell them today to convince them that it is a very valuable? and a great career in the future to, to, to be a transplanter. Sure. Um, well, I think the, the, the gateway to heart transplantation is clearly still heart surgery. Uh, and I, I tend to be a contrarian when the world is going in one direction. Uh, and right now, uh, the, the stock, if you will, of heart surgery is fairly low. Um, it's probably a great time to do it. Uh, there, there is a generation of people that are not going to be doing this in the near future. And the work itself is as exciting now as it was then. What's your take on these uh, working hour issues? Uh, I'm actually fine with it. Um, and that was a big issue for me as a chair of the Department of Surgery because uh, uh, I became criminally liable, potentially, if my residents were not adhering to it. Uh, as we studied the problem, what we learned is um, our use of time, our efficiency of the use of time of our trainees was abominable. It was awful. And time management, which if you're going to run an organization efficiently, if you're going to run a heart transplant program, you can't have everybody on call 24 7, 365. Um, people burn out. You've got to learn how to make handoffs to trust each other. Um, the way we, we solved it, actually, uh, two important issues with solving it. Um, the limitation was 80 hours. Uh, 
and everybody's concern was that the residents are going to get to the 80 hour and then you know the the clock's going to strike midnight and you're going to have to turn into a pumpkin like Cinderella and and leave the hospital the systems issue there is we designed our work hours to a 70 hour work week which gave people that additional flexibility so we didn't want to put anybody in the position where the clock would strike 12 and you were supposed to be out the door so they had a good deal of leeway and then the more important issue is we let the residents design the system of coverage so that's still uh, the system today yeah, yeah. In, at your hospital uh, oh, I, I believe that's still the system mm. uh, at Columbia there's no question that the residents were much better at figuring out their own workflow uh, than people 20 years their senior uh, whose workflow was completely different I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example my own residency when I was an intern spending 110 hours a week in the hospital, most of my work was uh, to check lab data and, and gather x-rays on people in the hospital that were going to be operated on the next day or that had a problem. We had no uh, what I'd call a batch query. Each one, you know, you made a phone call to the lab. You'd hope that somebody would answer and, uh, and tell you what the patient's, you know, uh, hematocrit was. Now, the, the, the residents can essentially uh, use their own IT skills uh, to do a batch query. And what it used to take me all day and all night uh, to do to gather information, and then, of course, handwrite it into the chart, they can do that batch query with you know four keystrokes on a computer, and you know what used to take me, you know, 45 hours a week to do, they don't have to do anymore. They don't need to go find X-rays, uh, you know, find the physical films that there was only one set of. The images are digital now, so I think in terms of the information gathering, it's it's much more uh, efficient than it was. Uh, and, and being cognizant of time, actually, for, particularly for cardiac surgeons, I think is extremely important. There is no cardiac surgeon, uh, to my mind, who, who has mastered the, the field, who does not have a very fine-tuned in, internal clock to know how long what he's doing in the operating room takes. I don't think you have to have quite that fine-tuned a clock for the rest of you. But if, if time is not something that you manage, it will manage you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Great. Pleasure.